Okay, in this video, <clears throat> excuse me, in this video I'm continuing the chapter on bearing selection uh, from Shigley for my MAE 4353 class at OSU. And earlier in the discussion we had reached the conclusion that to talk, to select a proper bearing, it has to last, it has, has to survive the force we're going to apply, it has to last long enough, and enough of them have to last so that customers don't complain. Okay, so when we talk about enough of them must last long enough, that's a reliability idea. So having first developed a, an equation that related load and life, right here, or this version of the equation expressed in a design form, and life expressed in hours where our desired load, our desired life are known, and the catalog life is known, then we know what load to go choose out of the catalog to meet a bearing. Looked at a problem, then we went through, talked about reliability, folded the reliability equation into it, and I said, this is the big equation of this chapter so far. We put in the load we intend to apply, may be amplified by a load factor we plug in the ratio of the life we want as compared to the catalog life. We plug in the reliability we expect for, from this bearing and some other constants that are given to us. Run the numbers and we get a load. And that load can be used in the catalog to find a bearing. When we find a bearing of this load right here, this number, that load is probably larger than we asked for right here because we're probably wanting longer life. XD is greater than one. And we're probably wanting reliabilities greater than 90%. So our pitiful little load that we're actually going to apply to the bearing is going to cause us to pick a bearing that's capable of carrying a huge load because we want that bearing to last longer and be more reliable. Okay, and so here's the equation in the form that we typically use at equation 11-17. We saw a problem that said our bearing, we plan to apply 14, 413 pounds to it, but we want long life, very long life, and high reliability. So we're going to pick a bearing that the catalog says carries almost 6,700 pounds. And we talked about the idea of square root of reliability for two bearings, or if we have three bearings, we'd take the cube root of reliability uh, to get to match our system reliability. Now we're going to do something else that's harmful to ball bearings. We've already looked at radial loading. That's the only load we've seen so far presumed to be applied in the radial direction. Now we're going to add to that same bearing some thrust loading. And that thrust loading is going to cause it to get damaged earlier. Okay, so this first sentence says a ball bearing is capable of resisting radial loading and thrust loading. It can do both. Okay, and furthermore, they, they really can do both. They can be combined. And so what we're going to do <coughs> is talk about a bearing that has to carry an axial load, FA, and a radial load, FR, or a thrust load. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, radial load or axial load. Okay, now, a bearing that will carry, that's capable of carrying those two loads... Uh, we only have one load in the catalog. Somehow, we've got to turn these two loads into one load that can go into this equation right here. But we need this one load to represent the equivalent damage caused by the two loads. So that's what this paragraph is saying. Yes, the bearing will carry a unique axial load combined with a radial load. But let's think about the damage done by the pair, and let's find an equivalent radial load that does the damage of both of these, and that's what we'll take to the catalog. Okay, so that's one concept, the equivalent radial load that does the same damage as the combined radial and thrust. Then the other thing is a rotation factor V is going to pop up. There's a presumption in the testing and rating of bearings that the outer ring of the bearing is stationary and that the inner ring rotates. So that one revolution of the inner ring 
moves the balls a certain distance but it turns out if you hold the inner ring stationary and rotate the outer ring the balls move further when the outer ring rotates while the inner ring is stationary to account for that we're going to have a rotation factor called v that is one or it's essentially not there when the inner ring rotates but we're going to raise it to 1.2 when the outer ring rotates okay and this v quantity it turns out plays a role in how we evaluate the effect of axial or thrust loading so here is a graph that for some reason they figured out needed to be and i need to zoom in on this quite a bit don't i let me find that zoom tool here it is i'll keep zooming in okay and so this oops i didn't want to do that this axis is fe over v fr it's a ratio of the equivalent load which does the same damage as the combined axial and radial so this is equivalent over radial load modified slightly by v the horizontal axis is let me see if i can scroll i'm going to have to change my cursor Okay, well now I'm able to scroll, that's good. So the horizontal axis is FA over VFR. This is axial over radial, and the other one was equivalent over radial. Let me zoom back out some now. Uh, let's see, that'd be a minus. Okay, so there's our graph. And look at, and so this is equivalent versus axial the thrust loading so the question is how does axial loading cause the equivalent load to rise and look at this graph here's how the data behaves and what it says is for very low values of axial load that f f or f e over f r is one okay that the equivalent load is the same as the radial load okay but as our axial starts to get really big all of a sudden the axial starting to do some damage and the equivalent load to last the same life starts heading upward uh, to a much larger number but that doesn't happen for a while I, what this says is a small amount of axial load that's an FA let me just zoom in on this a touch and scroll so you're gonna have to trust me that's an FA over FR this is FE over FR a certain amount of axial load does nothing okay and we can just use the radial load as our true load which is what we've been doing so far but then when we hit this point called E and E is different for different bearings, but it's labeled E. And I, every time I move the mouse right now, you can't see it. So here's E. When I reach the kink point, E, all of a sudden I head up a slope relationship between FE, the equivalent load, and the axial load. And that slope is a quantity called X, which again might be different for, di for different bearings, might not be. All right, so no worry about axial loads up to a point, and then all of a sudden they do damage. Let's look at how we're gonna put that into the equation. So the Fe over Fr is one, when Fa over Fr is small. How small? Less than this E quantity. But then things change. I move from being on the horizontal line, which is what this says, to being on the sloped line and this line is described by a slope x and a horizontal kink point e in the value of fa over fr that relationship is given that fe over vfr is equal to x plus y times the fa this is the vertical axis this is the horizontal axis okay and so this sort of says my vertical quantity is a constant 
plus another constant times my horizontal quantity. This is sort of a slope form of the equation. But this equation is only true when the axial over radial exceeds the kink value. So our process then is going to be for a given combined axial and radial load, we've got to know the kink point for the bearing. We've got to know this x value. I'm sorry, the x value was the intercept. The y was the slope. I said that wrong. x is where it crosses this axis. y is the slope. I've got to know these quantities for particular bearings before I can decide whether I have to account for damage because of axial loading. Now for various bearings of various characteristics, these x and y and e quantities are tabulated. We'll see that in just a second. Okay, and here it is. Okay, there is a quantity tabulated in the catalogs for bearing called C0. And this C0 is called the bearing static load rating. Okay, in a sense you would expect the bearing static load rating to say what's the largest static load applied one time that will not cause, that will not lead a bearing to failure. But we might be tempted to define uh, either change our meaning of failure or maybe we keep the same rate, uh, definition. But what was our definition of failure before? That we had material falling off the balls or the races of the bearing. Material was falling out because of fatigue and a certain number of square inches has already fallen out. Now when we're going to apply a static load to the bearing, we're not going to have chunks falling out. We may actually in fact yield that bearing and quite often this C0 value is larger than the yield strength of a bearing or yield, yield force in a bearing. Okay, but it is a number tabulated by the bearing companies and so each bearing we might choose has a different value of C0. But let's say that uh, our question really is, I have a bearing, I think it might work, I want to know if it will or not. If I have the bearing, then I, and I know what that bearing is, I can go to the catalog for that bearing and look up its C0 value. And then for that bearing, the other thing I know is, I know what axial load I intend to apply to that bearing, and I know what radial load I, tend, I intend to apply to that bearing. What I'm looking for is an equivalent load to decide if that bearing can handle the thrust. Okay, and so the process would be take the axial load I know I intend to apply and divide it by the C0 value for the bearing that I have in my hand is one way of doing it. Once I have that ratio, go find that value in the table. I hope the value I just computed lands right on one of these numbers because if I don't, I'm going to have to do thermodynamics type interpolation. But let's say that my FA over C0 land right on 0.070. If that's the case, then I slide over to this column and it tells me that that kink point, E, right there in the graph, that kink point E for that bearing is at 0.27. Okay, and now the question is, is my FA over VFR which is a measure of how big my axial load is. Is FA over VFR less than E? If that's true, that FA over VFR is less than the E for the bearing I just calculated, what does that mean? It means I'm on the left side of the kink, FA over VFR is to the left of the kink, and I'm on the one side of the line, okay? Where X is one and the slope is zero. What does the table say? X is one and the slope is zero if I'm to the left of the kink. But if I am at the kink or to the right of the kink, then it turns out X is a constant. It doesn't move around. It is a 0.56. But the slope of the curve changes depending on where I am within this table. And so if I'm operating with an FA over VFR greater than 0.27, for this particular FA over C0, then I've got to jump over here to these numbers and I will blend my axial and my radial loading 
using these x and y numbers which means I'm on the slope part of the curve using let's see where the equation go using this equation and what I'm going to do is solve this equation for Fe the equivalent load and I'll take that load to a catalog but I probably have to modify it for life and reliability and maybe even an application factor all right that's the process it sounds confusing I'm sure uh, this is the equation I pointed to a moment ago solved for Fe let's see so finally we get to some bearing tables because we hadn't seen them yet and so this is a table that carries that describes potentially various sizes various geometries of bearings okay and so this shows how a width series zero these all have these are all sort of moderate widths okay um, these are or these are wider widths this may be a little narrower uh, this is much wider bearing series okay shows how the various numbers vary within a bearing family and so this table is for single row bearings not double row O2 series deep groove and angular contact ball bearings O2 series would be right here okay uh, in the width series and so these bearings from the O2 series which would have bores in measured in millimeters okay and notice in the O2 series there's only one bearing of each bore size and as the bore size goes up the outer diameter goes up the width goes up but notice for deep groove bearings we have a C10 life which tells us a lot about the survivability of a bearing and we have a static load rating for the bearing now this is what's interesting and I don't fully understand how the experiments are done but notice that the uh, life that lasts a million revolutions is less than the static load rating and if the static load rating were yield okay then this says I'm gonna apply a load that is more than yield and it's not gonna start losing chips right away I don't lose enough chips to call it the bearing dead until I've applied this load for a million revolutions and that's fairly amazing okay so here is a table which is just one table out of a multi hundred page catalog for one set of bearings but we're going to use them for homework problems as just a representative set of bearings <clears throat> okay this table okay this table is for ball bearings the one above this table is for cylindrical roller bearings of an O2 series and an O3 series and let me remember if there's anything more there's not again we have bore sizes width sizes we have C10 life ratings and we have C0 life ratings now these are for cylindrical bearings let me see if I put a picture in there I didn't but cylindrical bearings basically cylindrical rollers aren't designed to carry thrust do not try to carry thrust through cylindrical type bearings even though they have this C0 term which implies maybe we could apply that methodology don't do it now we talked about application factors earlier okay uh, I'm sorry not application factors that's still to come okay how long do we need bearings to last we just made up a number earlier but if we're talking about instruments that aren't used very often light duty maybe half a thousand hours 500 hours is appropriate aircraft engines 500 to 2,000 hours why such a small number for aircraft engines because they are inspected they are torn down they're rebuilt at fairly frequent integral intervals and so since they're inspected often the bearings don't have to last much longer than the expect inspection period okay intermittent service or short service four to eight thousand hours okay machines that need 24 hour a day of service uninterrupted 50 to 60 thousand hours okay machines continuous 24 hour service 
where reliability is of extreme importance, you would design them to last 100 to 200,000 hours. So these are some jet suggestions on how many hours you might want to design a bearing to last. We saw the application factor earlier and we saw the value of 1.2 uh, suggested application factors in the 1.2 range are not terribly special. That would be either no impact or light impact would be in the 1.2 range, sort of straddling these two. Moderate impact says we might want to use a 1.5 or a 3 load factor or application factor. So this table gives some suggestions. If we're carrying precision gears, okay, ultra precision gears, we don't need much of a load factor. Commercial gears, on the other hand, not quite as good as precision gears. We need a bit more of a load factor. I think you get the idea there. And again, these load factors do nothing but raise the load we plan to apply mathematically in the equation to account for a bit more damage. Okay, how do we handle, what's the process for choosing a bearing? And I'm going to need to zoom out a little bit. What's the process for designing or selecting or choosing a bearing to work in a situation where we're going to have axial loading. So, an SKF 6210 angular contact ball bearing has an axial load FA of 400 pounds and a radial load of 500 pounds. And the outer ring of that bearing is stationary when we run it, which means V equal one. The basic static load rating C0 is 4450. How do we know that? We went to this table and we looked it up. And the basic load rating, C10, is 7,900 pounds. Estimate the life of this bearing at a speed of 7,200 RPM. So we are going to apply the table. We're not designing. We already have the bearing. Our question is, how long will it last? Now, how can we answer that question? Going back to our fundamental equation, I've said when we're doing design, that equation will typically be solved for this load. But this equation algebraically, well, let's not point to the one with numbers, let's go here. This equation algebraically could be solved for life. Okay, solve for the life number. If I know the load I plan to apply, and if I know the catalog load of the bearing, and I know the reliability that I've wanted, I can solve for the actual life of the bearing. Uh, that might be interesting to me. So that's what this homework problem is. But it's a homework problem where I want to know the life of the bearing when thrust is present and large, relatively large. Uh, 400 pounds of thrust, 500 pounds of radial. And so I've already said outer ring stationary, V is 1. F axial is 400. C0 is 4450. That ratio is near 0.1 or it's 0.090. I go back to the table and I hope that 0.090 is in there. Uh, 0.090 is not in there. It's straddling somewhere between 084 and 0.1. And so I'm going to interpolate as I did in thermo and find a value of E. To compare to FA over VFR. Now I'm going to scroll back down and get the numbers. I wish, and let me see if I didn't keep that table handy for the problem. I did not. Okay, and so the interpolation shows, sort of shows the interpolation pattern, which says E, which is between 0.28 and 0.30, E interpolating on the 090 value has E of 0.285. Now I need to calculate FA over VFR. That comes out to be 0.8, which is a lot bigger than 0.285. What does that mean? It means I am to the right of 0.285 with my 0 0.8. 0 0.8 is way to the right of 0.285. That means I'm on the slopey side of that bearing curve, that bearing load curve. Okay, so I'm not on the side where it's horizontal with no effect of axial load. I'm on the side where x is equal to point, let's see, x is equal to the given value, and I forgot what it is, and y has to be interpolated. 
okay, and y being between 1.55 and 1.45. Interpolating the 090 gives a 1.527 value for y, and the x value is a 0.56 everywhere in that table. So my equivalent loading is x times v times force radial plus y times force axial. x is 0.56, v is 1, my radial load was 500 pounds, and then my y value is 1.527, just interpolated, times my axial load of 400 pounds is 890 pounds. So the load that is equivalent to 400 plus the 500, not combined as a vector, don't be tempted to do that, but combined properly using the bearing behavior, the equivalent load that causes just as much damage as the radial and com axial load combined is 890 pounds. Then if I am not f fussy about reliability, uh, then or if I want a 90% reliability, did it give any other reliability? It did not, so I'm just presuming 90% reliability. I can go back to my equation, okay, and I can even go back to the one that was before we had a reliability in, which is what they did. They went way back for the equation that had no reliability in it, but we could use the one with reliability in it and solve that equation for life and says this bearing in this situation will last 16,000 uh, hours. Okay, this is the equation they inverted to solve for life right here. Okay, so that bearing lasts 16,000 hours. But the key thing we did, what's new, is we calculated the equivalent load, 890, which does the same amount of damage as the 400 combined with the 500. Let's see. Variable loading, I don't really want to get into. Let me see. What I need to do is, this is called, okay, yeah, we're getting into it. This is fine. Selection of ball and cylindrical roller bearings. So, so far, all we've done is analyze the behavior of bearings. We haven't done any selection yet. So, I think this example we take a quick peek is going to involve this table because it's going to involve thrust so let's look at everything about this problem and that's all I'm going to cover in this chapter so we have two shafts because we're going to talk about the second shaft on a parallel shaft 2500 horse 25 horsepower uh, crane speed reducer or gearbox and it contains a helical gear <coughs> excuse me of a certain size don't worry too much about that but helical gears transmit loads in the radial direction in the tangent direction and in the thrust direction and we'd have to go to chapter 13 to see that okay therefore there's a lot of forces being passed around between two helical gears running on two different shafts okay the division of those forces can be calculated and they have already been done and that's shown in a figure that's about to come then the question is what loads are our bearings going to see at location c and location d let's take a look at the picture here is the shaft we care about here is location d here is location c here is where a gear is mounted on this shaft. The shaft runs axially this way. This is the location of two different bearings. And what I want to do is do the statics to know what kind of loads in the X, loads in the Y, sorry, loads in the X would be axial, loads in Y and Z. I want to know those loads so I can combine them properly and choose the correct size bearing. Now the loads that's coming in from the gears is a 250 pound inward radial load, a 595 pound tangential load, and a 344 pound axial load. Here are the three loads from one gear that's on another shaft over here somewhere. Those loads are being passed through a circular gear right here. You got to imagine it 
and the loads have those three loads have that magnitude the the question is choose the bearings now in the initial part of the problem we would not know these numbers right here which represent the x direction now the y direction loads and the z direction loads at bearing d and the same information at bearing c we would not know that without doing static so step one is do the statics and we've talked about this kind of a picture and the statics it implied i think back in mech one so now let's carry on it says the bearing reactions calculated with statics at point c and at point d those bearing reactions are given they assume that they're simply supported okay a ball bearing is being selected for location c so that it can carry the thrust and we're going to use a cylindrical roller bearing at point D. Let's go back to that. The bearing at C is going to cover the thrust loading. Now, the only thrust loading in the picture is 344 pounds of thrust loading coming in from the gear, which has to be resisted by 344 pounds of load, axial load in the bearing uh, over here at C. This one carries all of the thrust loading bearing D will not have any thrust loading at all. That's our presumption. <clears throat> okay, the life goal of this speed reducer is 10,000 hours with a reliability factor for all four bearings equal to exceed 0.96. Okay, or 90% system reliability. Okay, the application factor is going to be a 1.2 select a roller bearing for location D and select a ball bearing angular contact for location C where we assume the inner ring rotates that's everything that we have to do let's see how we put all these numbers together um, <clears throat> let's see and we do have we're making note that we have two shafts therefore four bearings and with all four bearings we want the system or the gearbox total reliability to be 96 percent that's going to say something fairly extreme about the reliability needed for each bearing so going to the calculations the loads given including a torque transmitted into the shaft which is our tangential load times the radius of the shaft uh, that would be a torque transmitted and the speed oh this is why we're not couldn't quite figure out why we need that we do not know the speed of the gearbox if you jump back up did they tell us anywhere the speed of this gearbox the answer is no but we do know that it's a 25 horsepower gearbox that's sneaky and if we know this tangential load that tangential load is the only thing that will cause a torque in this gearbox and torque times right rotational speed is power so the torque is that known 595 pound load times a radius of 4.04 .04 inches or 2404 pounds force inch of torque okay uh, now the power equation which is three point that's equation 3-40 in the textbook way back there page 138 uh, but the horsepower equation we can re rearrange this is torque times rpm divided by 63,000 is horsepower but we're going to solve the horsepower equation in terms solve it for uh, rpm uh, 63,000 the constant 25 horsepower 2404 is the torque gives us a gearbox speed of 655 rpm now it is massively unusual that you would have to calculate the speed of your gearbox back calculated from horsepower and gear forces uh, chances are you would already know the speed of your gearbox and the speed of your shafts okay but given that we now we know the rep, the rpm of the shaft that we're dealing with now we need to look at the loads carefully this 106 is a radial direction load it's in the y direction this 297 is a radial direction load it's in the z direction according to this one right here 
Since they're both radial loads, I can use Pythagorean to combine those two radial loads and come up with a total radial load. I could even figure out the angle if I wanted to, but that won't matter. I can do that at this end and get a total radial load. And I can combine the 356 and the 297 to get a total radial load at this end. I do not in any way combine the 344 with those. That's a different kind of beast. That's an axial load. Let's go look at what they do with that. Okay, so they're saying the radial load at D is the Pythagorization of the 106 and the 297 for a combined radial load of the two of 316. Doing the same kind of thing at C, combining those two components, is a 464 radial load at bearing C. Uh, but bearing C also gets to carry thrust. So now we need to turn to individual bearing reliability. If we presume that every bearing has the same reliability, and we want a 96% system reliability, and we have four bearings, see that little four right there? Then we're going to take the fourth root of the system reliability, 0.96, and come up with a required reliability of 98.989 reliability, or roughly 99% reliability per bearing, with the set of four would give us a system reliability of 96%. Okay, and so now that we know the life and we know the rating life for the bearings, we can calculate the x value that's going to be used. Our life divided by 10 to the 6th. Our life computed from 10,000 hours and 655 RPM comes up to be a life ratio x of 393. That's a non-dimensional life ratio. But that 393 is multiplying the 1 million. So I expect this bearing, each of these bearings, to last 393 million revolutions. And I expect a reliability of 90%. Okay. So now I've got the life ratio. And if I am not worried about thrust, then I could go to this C10 equation and go right to the catalog and look up a bearing. Okay, now there is one bearing where I'm not worried about thrust. And that bearing is the cylindrical bearing at, or the roller bearing at D. And so I can apply this equation without worrying about the X's and the Y's and the E's and the C zeros. Okay, I do use an amplification factor of 1.2. The bearing at D okay had a, a total radial load of 316 after being pythagorized my life ratio 393 i've already calculated that i use my weibo parameters that were given earlier but i do remember that what is typically a one over three for ball bearings a is three okay is different for roller bearings where A is 10 thirds. Therefore, this, this 1 over A becomes 3 tenths. Knowing all of this stuff, including my application factor, I can crunch out that I need to go to the catalog and find a bearing that will carry three, 35, almost 3,600 pounds force. A bearing that can survive 3,600 pounds force of pure radial load for 10 to the 6th revolutions, that bearing will survive a combined 400 pound axial load and a combined 500 pound radial load. It'll survive both of those and it'll survive for a huge number of uh, revolutions, 393 million. And it'll do so with a 99.9% reliability. Okay, that 99% reliability drove this number higher. If we had only put a 90% reliability right here, that number would be much, liar, much lower. We were able to go straight to the tables with this 3591 pounds force, or we converted to 16 kilonewtons, because that table may only have loads in kilonewtons. We'll check. Okay. 
but uh, I can go straight to the tables for this bearing because this bearing carries no thrust and I happen to be choosing a roller bearing precisely the fact for the fact that I don't need this bearing to carry any thrust okay now I haven't picked my bearing yet but I can go right to the table and pick it did I include the table I did not so 16 kilonewtons don't get dizzy here 16 kilonewtons or 3591 pounds force let's go to the roller bearing table way back here bear with me tables are here somewhere here we go okay cylindrical roller bearing different sizes here the O2 series or the O3 series the rating in kilonewtons this one is 16 kilonewtons the O3 series the C10 is does that say 28 kilonewtons what that means is any bearing in this table will survive okay we'll probably go with the O2 series 25 millimeter bore if that fits our shaft okay but any bearing in this table will at least carry the 16 kilonewtons that we find right here at the beginning of the table let's go see what they said about that I think they're gonna say any bearing would work almost there okay in the absence of thrust we can choose the O2-25 or we could choose the O3-25 they are going to work and any bearing in that table will work now we're ready to deal with the ball bearings and what we have right here is a design recipe this is worth highlighting this next section is worth highlighting in a big way because it makes a suggestion on how to start what ends up being an iterative process that starts with a guess and so here's what we're going to do we're going to say the ball bearing at C does have thrust okay then here's where we're, how we select the bearing first of all let's assume that FA over VFR is bigger than E we're gonna make that guess okay why because the only other thing we could do is uh, we, we would have to interpolate from something and we don't even know what to interpolate on so let's guess that we're on the right hand side of the table and then go to the table and if we're on the right hand side we got to pick a Y2 we know X just pick one and if we don't have any clue on where to pick maybe we pick from the middle of the table once we pick the Y2 we can use the load blending equation and the life load reliability equation to find a C10 and then go pick a bearing once we pick the bearing note it has a C0 value then do the check version calculate FA over C0 that'll take us into the table and we get a new value of Y2 when we interpolate that probably doesn't match the Y2 that we guessed but we'll get a new one and from the Y2 we'll follow the process and find the C10 and if this C10 happened to be exactly that C10 then we would have picked the same bearing and we would be back where we started and we'd be right but chances are this new C10 is different and quite often it's higher which would lead us to pick a larger bearing but if we end up being at the same size bearing then we select that bearing and stop okay that's the procedure so here's how we're gonna follow it we're just gonna choose that X2 is 0.56 but they're all 0.56 in the right hand side of the table and we're gonna pick a Y2 of 1.63 now somewhere around here I did print the table out here's the table y of 1.63 looks to be right in the middle of the table to me so we're making sort of an ignorant middle of the table guess of x equal 0.6 but that's true everywhere and y equal 1.63 and then we go through the calculation and the checking process so with this guess and knowing that v is equal to 1 we will then take our equation and solve for fe over vfr is equal to x plus y over v times that x is 0.56 
y is 1.63, v is 1, because the outer ring rotates, f axial, 344, f radial, 464. Where did those come from? The axial was given to us right in the beginning of the problem. This particular radial, we had to do a Pythagorean step to get that 464 radial loading, loading. But in any case, this entire right-hand side is known, which means the left-hand side, all of this stuff combined has a value of 1.77. And then if we want to, we can solve from the 1.77 directly for Fe, because we know V and we know Fr. So Fe is the 1.77 times the V of one times the FR, which we can uh, get, well, I think it was right here, the 464.4, plug that in, and we get an equivalent load of 822 pounds, or 366 kilonewtons. But this is the equivalent load, but it's at a life load and rely, or a load and rely, no, life and reliability uh, that does not match the table, so we need to convert. So we're going to take the 822 right here. Actually, we're going to take the 306, 3.66 kilonewtons right here. That's our known load. And that is the load that is the equivalent of the radial and the axial load. <coughs> Multiply by an application factor of 1.2 because this one seems to need it. We had already earlier created, calculated a life ratio of 393. That hasn't changed. But now we're using the ball bearing equation, and the key difference is the one-third instead of the three-tenths. <coughs> Don't forget that change when we go from ball bearings to roller bearings and back. And so processing our equivalent radial load uh, to, co to the combined radial and axial at 3.6 says, processing it through the life and reliability correction equation gives us a 53.4 kilonewton C10 value. That's a load I'll go look for in the catalog, and I want to look in the ball bearing catalog. And we were told to look in the O2 series angular contact section of the catalog. Let's see, did I print those? It appears that I did not. Uh, so I'm just going to say, you've got your book nearby. I'm going to let you go to the catalog in the book table 11-2 pardon the yawn it's about 11:15 right now okay but for the angular contact bearings look at the o2-60 you should see a c10 load of 55.9 kilonewtons okay which is slightly bigger than the 53.4 kilonewtons that that the 3.66 turned into 53.4 when we processed the life and the reliability aspect. But there is no bearing in the table with a 53.4. The first bearing that's bigger than 53.4 is a 55.9. An 02-60 is its size. Now here's the important thing. That particular bearing has a C0 of 35.5. Okay, we didn't choose anything based on a C0 earlier, but we need to check and see where we stand. And so now that we have a bearing and we know it's C0, we can now calculate FA over C0 and a 1 down here because V is equal to 1. And we get a 0 0.0431. Okay, 0 0.0431. Let's go back to this E table. Uh, no, let's go forward to that table, sorry. Bear with me. Okay, so 0 0.0431. Scrolling through here, 0 0.042, 0 0.056. Now, 0 0.043 is not terribly far from 042. Okay, and we can see that. And so, yes, maybe we should interpolate, but we ought to be getting an E value very close to 0 0.24. More importantly, we ought to be getting a Y2 value of 1.85. Well, we guessed 1.63. That's not a wonderful match, so we've got more calculation to do. 
and let's see so we found a bearing this one that had a C0 we calculated the FA over C0 we looked at the table and uh, from E of 0.24 we let's see FA over VFR sorry I forgot that check notice this check right here we only go to these numbers if FA over VFR is bigger than E well what was E E was about a 0.24 what is FA over VFR it is 0.74 that's way bigger than 0.24 so we're definitely in the right hand side of this table there's no doubt about that and so we will interpolate a value of y2 based on our fa over c0 of just a little bit bigger than 042 but if we assumed it was right on 042 we would be at a y2 value of 1.85 and i gotta believe now if we interpolated we'd get a little bit better answer 1.84 is what this thing would say about interpolation instead of the 1.85 i'll buy that now what do we do with it we use the new y value 1.84 to do a new corrected equivalent load so fa over vfr is equal to the x value 0.56 plus the y value times fa over vfr this is fa this is fr that's a value of 1.92 from which we can solve for fe because we know v and we know FR 464 so the equivalent load is 892 pounds or 3.97 kilonewtons how does that compare to the kilonewtons we got way back here 3.66 kilonewtons out of the pure correction equation before we corrected for life load and reliability 3.66 now it is 3.97 well that's a bit of a difference okay now here's something you want to watch out for, and I'm not sure it's worth the trouble. We could take the 3.97, and we could take it back to this equation right here, putting the 3.97 right there, nothing else has changed, put the 3.97 right there, and calculate a new C10. But what they said was, uh, if all we're changing out is this number, then that number remains a constant and 1.2 times that number remains a constant and this answer will simply ratio as this number gets bigger and smaller and so our new number is bigger so if we just multiply the c10 by the ratio of the numbers here and that was a 3.9 something to 3.6 will increase the c10 to go by the increase by the same ratio so what they said is C10, okay, is 3.97 over 3.66 times the 53.4 that we got out of the equation earlier. Let's make sure we see that. This equation produced the 53.4. If I increase the 3.66 to a bigger number, clearly that number has to go up and the relationship is linear. And so... I can use the ratio 3.97 to 3.66 multiplying by that number that's what happens here to get a 57.9 kilonewton I need a bigger bearing than I picked earlier okay so I didn't go back to the same spot in the table earlier in the table I went to the 53.4 spot now I'm going to be going to the 57.9 spot. The question is, did I change bearings? Okay. Uh, and so, let's see. Did I bring bearing table along? I did not, but here's what this thing says. I chose an 02-60 earlier. And looking at that, I chose the 02-60 because it had, let's see, where is it? it had a C10 of 55.9 which was bigger than my 53.4 but that 53.55.9 is not bigger than my new number 
Where's my new number? I forgot it. Okay, my new number is 57.9. My old analysis uh, of this bearing, which is good for 55.9, will not handle the 57.9 that I've just calculated. i got to bump the bearing size up. I may bump it up to the very next size, which would be an 02-65. Let's go see. I go to the 0265 bearing and I see a C10 of 63.7. That is certainly bigger than the 57.9. As a matter of fact, it's a lot bigger than the 57.9. I suspect we have found our bearing that will work, but we got to do one more round of iterations to prove it. Okay, and so we know our bearing. We look up its C0 value. We calculate FA over C0 and get a 0 0.0369 value. Interpolating here gives us a Y2 value of 1.9 because 0.036 is between 0 0.028 and 0 0.042 in the FA over C0 table. So we interpolate a 1.9 and then we execute our equivalent load equation and solve for FE of 913 pounds force or 4.06 kilonewtons okay of equivalent load and it's equivalent to the damage done by both the radial and the axial combined and so we take the 4.065 but we've got to process it through the reliability and life equation we don't have to rerun the entire equation we can ratio the 4.07 to the 3.66 and the 53.4 that we had earlier and come up with a C10 of 59.4. Okay, we're ready to go to the catalog and pick a bearing, but remember we looked at the 02-65 earlier and that 02-65 was good for 63.7. We guessed an 02-65 by knowing the 63.7 was bigger than our 57.9 that made us choose it but now our new calculated load 59.4 that 63.7 is still bigger I don't change bearings I accept the 02-65 that's the bearing that I want and so my iterations are done now let me see if I went to the next interesting equation. I have not in these notes, but I'll tell you what the other interesting equation would be. I've picked a bearing, the O2-65, which has capability of 63.7. I'm only going to use it at a 59.4 level, so I'm going to load it a little more lightly than the table says I could. What that means is if I'm going to load it less, I might be able to consider that its life is going to go up since I'm not loading it as much as I could be. So I could say I could recalculate the life if I wanted to. Or lowering the load lets me believe I'm keeping the same life but increasing my reliability. And I can check that if I wish. But in any case, I found my two bearings. I found the roller bearing on one end and I found my ball bearing on the other end which is going to carry the axial loading and, I, and both of those bearings now will get the job done. And that's as far as we're going to go this semester on bearings. What I need to do is take a look at another problem or two with you. I'm not going to do that tonight. You've got about two hours of lecture here to process and there's some example problems that I've gone over. Process that and probably in a couple of days I'll look at another uh, bearing or so with you and I'll give you some, some homework to work on. You're still working on the weld table, most of you. And so, it is 11.30. I'm sleepy. I quit for today. Good night.